What's the word, y'all? It's official. Larry Markin has signed his five-year, $238 million contract to stay with the Utah Jazz. Let me repeat that. Five years, $238 million. I want to first of all say congratulations to Larry and his family. This is a ridiculous amount of money. I'm so very happy for them. But this news dropped about 10 a.m. my time. And I have not been able to stop thinking about it for the last five hours. And damn it, I got this channel to talk about the things that's on my mind, hoop related. So let's talk about it. So I feel like this just has so many implications for Larry Market himself, for the Utah Jazz, for other teams across the association. I mean, if you have not been completely locked in, this is no surprise that he signed this extension. We had been, it had been rumored for the last couple days that he loves Utah, all of these things that they were taking calls potentially, but the conversation between them and some other teams had died down. We'll talk about that. But him signing this contract today instead of signing it yesterday means that he is not eligible to be traded at all for the entirety of the 24-25 season. So if you had a Larry Market into the OKC Thunder, a Larry Market into the to the Warriors trade drawn up, you gotta wait until next season, bro. Cut it out. He can't be moved anymore. And I feel like that is just different. That is just different. We haven't seen a, a, a front office like this, I guess, give up the leverage that you normally have as the front office. I've said this before. I don't know. Should I still be able to say this after a guy on my team has not been able to be traded? I feel like there's no such thing as an untradable contract. Bradley Beal made that very apparent last season when he had a no trade clause and like $200 million guaranteed over the next four years and he was still able to be moved. So the way these front offices run... I will give Larry Market a $238 million, but I'm going to sign him yesterday, which means that he's eligible still to be traded on trade deadline. I'm going to tell Larry Market all the great things. We want to keep you here in Utah, but at the end of the day, we, we still want the leverage to say that if the deadline comes around and things ain't working the way we wanted to, we can just move you to your next team. I mean, the most prime example of this, and we've talked about it a lot, is a guy like Blake Griffin. Well, Blake Griffin was told that he, he was supposed to be a Clipper for life. Put your name on the dotted line, Blake. We're we going to have you up there with Gandhi and Barack Obama. And then they traded him a few months later. A trade like, a, a deal like this eliminates all of that type of leverage that the front office has. And I just think it's different. Larry Markkinen has been a guy that has been very vocal um, uh, behind closed doors and in the public about him wanting not to just win, but him wanting to win in Utah. Larry Market had one of the smoothest contracts, $18 million to get all-star production. There was, there's no surprise that a team like the Golden State Warriors is calling Danny Ainge and company to try, to try to put that deal together because he was guaranteed only $18 million. That is pennies, dog. That is pennies compared to where the CBA and the cap is going. You're telling me I got an extra year of that if I trade him right now and then I could give him that contract? So it makes sense for him to be a valuable, valuable asset on the market. And Danny Ainge and company was like, well, we took the calls. We weren't in love with the deal, so we'd rather keep him here. And for a market like Utah, I understand the idea behind it, but I guess time will tell whether or not this all makes sense. Um, but it is just interesting. The 2025 draft class is supposed to be one of them ones. Again, I'm not completely locked in as of right now. I know Cooper Flag, I know Ace Bailey, I know the French point guard, Nolan, last name, who I, don't, I ain't heard yet, so I can't pronounce it. I know VJ. I know a lot of these guys by name. I don't know if all of them are going to live up to the potential hype, but with this draft class being as stacked as it was, I thought that it made sense for the Jazz not just to field these offers from Larry Marketing, but to pick one of them in order to be very, very bad. Because over the last couple of years in the Larry Marketing era, this team starts off the first two and a half months of the season. We like, damn. The Utah Jazz are kind of sneaky. They nice. They're fun. Will Hardy got them playing. They're a 500 team. And then eventually they like, you know what? We don't really want to be a 500 team. Let's take our foot off the gas a little bit over the last couple months. Let's lose a bunch. And now we're picking at pick number nine and pick number 10. That has just been the way it has gone over the last couple seasons. So keeping Larry Marketing on the roster potentially puts them in that same exact spot. Well, we're like they, they have a roster that will be able to compete on a night and night basis. Again, how many wins are they going to have? I'm not, not expecting them to win 40. Hey, I don't know if I expect them to win 35, but they're going to be good enough to steal some of those games. And in a draft class like this, you wonder what is more valuable, winning a couple more games for your personal in-room in development or losing those games to get the higher odds. And there are two teams that is building like this. And I just find it interesting to figure out, again, it, it will be years before we, we know if this was the right idea or not. But them and the, the Toronto Raptors are two teams that are building this way. Now, 
for, for what it's worth, Danny Ainge pulled off two great trades over the last couple of years. When he traded Donovan Mitchell, he got Larry Market in a bunch of picks. And when he traded Rudy Gobert, he got a bunch of picks and other stuff. So it's like they still have all the draft capital in the world. It's just not draft capital that they control themselves. When you have your own first round pick, you can you control your destiny. The Nets, perfect example. They control their own destiny. And guess what? They traded or probably will be trading everything that could potentially help them win a bunch of games this season. We're going to be as bad as possible this year. And I thought that the Jazz would be a team, especially because I know Danny Ainge watched Cooper Flag and that select team, be like, you know what, Lowry, we love you and we want to keep you, but maybe it makes sense for us to move you so we can find the 1A building block. Because as much as I love Lowry Markham, he's a stud and every single year of his career, he's got better and better and better. I don't know if I'll ever look at him and say he's going to be the 1A on a championship level team while somebody in his draft class could be that. And I'm like, I'm like on a fence about all this. I don't have a, a very firm stance on this, but, but I, I'm trying to rationalize it a little bit, right? So these are the standings from last season. I would expect the Detroit Pistons are not going to be that, that great to be outside of the lottery, right? They're going to be better this year than a 14-win team after their offseason, but I'm not expecting them to be all the way up here. Could they be that? Maybe, I, I, I don't know. The Wizards, objectively, are going to be bad. So, so let, let's take a step back. These are the teams that will be bad on purpose this season. You have the Wizards. You have the Brooklyn Nets. I want to put the Bulls in there, but they still got that Vucevic and Zach Levine on the roster. And not saying that those dudes are going to be making us a 40-win team, but they won't be or they shouldn't be in the same conversations as Brooklyn and, Brooklyn and Washington. And then out West is going to be like, Portland out west and this might maybe one team better than the Utah Jazz right or worse than the Utah Jazz right now and that might be enough for Danny Ainge to say we don't need to trade Larry Marketing because the, because these other teams out west are going to be so good that our current roster just might not be good enough to win 31 games again like they did last season maybe be, with Memphis coming back and the Spurs making some moves and the Rockets having another year continuity and the Kings adding DeMar DeRozan and the Warriors doing whatever the hell they did these are the teams that we were in the same realm with last season. Realm is very generous. Those teams are significantly better than us now. So we can have our cake and eat it too, potentially. Well, we can have Larry Marketing on the roster and still be one of the bottom feeders. So boom, we somehow luck out. We become one of the four worst teams in basketball. We have a top four pick. Now we pair Ace Bailey and Larry Marketing. Well, I like that a lot more than, than Ace Bailey by himself. Or maybe we pair Cooper Flag with Larry Market. Oh, I like that better than Larry Market and Keontae George by themselves. So again, it takes uh, it's gonna take a lot of luck in order to make it happen, especially now. But I kind of a little bit under understand it because at the end of the day, with the flat nods, you you really just playing a game of luck where you can be the Detroit Pistons. No disrespect, Pistons fans. I ain't trying to take shots at you. Where you can be the Detroit Pistons and have the worst record in the league three years in a row and still end up with the fifth overall pick every season. Or you can be the Atlanta Hawks. Or you can be the Trailblazers from the previous year. They had the fifth highest odds. They jumped into the top three. Or you can be the Sacramento Kings from the year before who had the seventh highest odds and ended up at four with Keegan Murray. Like, it's all a game of luck. And with the flattened odds, you take that chance more than in previous years where, like, if this was 2013, then it makes sense to have two real NBA players in your roster and the rest be G-leaguers because, well, that could get us um, Ben Simmons and then the pick that ended up being Markel Fultz, or I guess the pick that ended up Jason Tatum and it ended up Markel Fultz. The flattened odds make it a little bit more reasonable to make this happen. And it's not, this is not a Victor Wimbanyama year. Maybe it will, maybe it will be. Maybe Cooper Fly goes to Duke and he is really everything in a bag of chips and nobody in the draft class to mess with him. But from all accounts, this is not a, a 1A and then everybody else is not good. So maybe you end up with the third pick and the third pick ends up being, again, these guys haven't played yet, VJ. And VJ could be the best guy in the draft eventually. So they, them side of Larry Marketing does not put them out of contention to win the lottery next season or be in the top four in the lottery. Because the roster is okay, but it's still the 14th best roster in, in the Western Conference. It still might be the 25th best roster in all of basketball. And again, you need a little bit of luck. He's 27 years old. Um, and I, I want to see Larry Markin in the playoff series. Unfortunately, I don't like it's happening anytime soon. And I think with Buddy Heald making the playoffs last year and playing real minutes that Larry Markin is the oldest player in the league without any playoff experience. Um, but at the end of the day, he's found a place that he feels really happy about. Um, 
And Utah is the place to be, at least for one more full season. Hell, I can make this whole video, and then the day that he's eligible to trade the next offseason, he's out the door. I don't know. But this changes the market because he was the best potentially trade a guy out there. And of course, there have been rumblings between the, the, uh, the Spurs a little bit. We saw um, the Warriors is the biggest one. And, you know, you can go into what the Warriors were really willing to give up. They didn't want to give up pods. They didn't want to give up Kaminga. They wanted to give up Moody and a bunch of draft picks. Utah Jazz said, no, you got to give us one or both of those dudes. The Warriors said no. And they said, hell, okay, then don't call my phone no more. Larry Market has put your name on this dotted line. And I think that well, my, my producer on my podcast, Greg, texted me saying uh, FML because he's a Warrior fan and he wanted Larry Market in a ton. Um, and, and with this, I don't know what the secondary option is for the Warriors. It's not going to be Brandon Ingram, I don't think, unless they really panicking. It's not going to be Zach Levine because that would be a real panic move. I don't think that makes sense for them. Larry Marketing kind of makes sense because he would be a plug and play player. That's one of the best things about Larry Marketing. Um, and then you have some of the infrastructure that I feel like he could be elite at. And you lost Klay Thompson. Larry Market is a seven foot sniper, not the prime Klay Thompson level, but he's a seven foot sniper that kind of changes the way you can play because you haven't had a player like him other than Kevin Durant. Uh, obviously, Kevin Durant 20 times better, but like a seven foot sniper that can score on different uh, angles. You haven't had a guy like that in some time. That's that's dead. So what's the backup plan for the Warriors? The backup plan is probably just going into the season with the new pieces that they have. And I wonder if this is an indication from Mike Dunleavy and company that say that, hey, we don't really believe that us adding one all-star caliber player to Steph Curry and Draymond Green is enough for us to really compete at the top of the West. So why trade away AirPods? Why trade away Kaminga if adding Larry Marketing can get us in the playoffs, but at the end of the day, we still lose a series against the OKC Thunder, the Minnesota Timberwolves, Dallas Mavericks, so on and so forth. It's interesting because we've seen the Warriors be ran one way, um, but now they have a new guy. And we don't really know what Mike Dunleavy is thinking out there. It's just different. And Bob Myers, we kind of had an idea of what type of players he enjoyed, what type of system and, and team he wanted to build. Now we don't know. We see Klay Thompson walk, walk to his next team. And we brought in some solid role players for what it's worth, but that's kind of it. I've always been a guy, this team, Steph Curry, which means that I think that the one singular timeline should be the Steph Curry timeline. Um, how long it might take for AirPods or Kaminga or even Moses Moody, one of the young guys to really blossom enough to turn it into a big three or to turn it into a championship contender might be just a little bit longer than what you want. So I've always been a guy that's like, man... If you can maximize the Steph Curry era, you do that, even if that means you trade away a Kaminga, because Kaminga's about to get paid too is like in a year or so. How much is his what's his market? Do we want to be the team that pays him that amount of money? I was always team go, go, go for Steph because you you owe it to him after what he's done. Him taking a pay cut with his ankle injuries and, and, and making it so that Kevin Durant can be on the team, being flexible enough to recognize that, hey, if Kevin Durant comes to this team, I might not be the star of the show no more, but hell, I'll do that in order to win more championships and then eventually win it one on his own without Kevin Durant. Like he owe, you owe the world to him, in my opinion, which means that you should go all in, even if that means that in five years down the line, you're looking around like what is there? You took a chance. And I feel like they haven't really taken a chance. They, they haven't really done that. They, it feels like they've been kind of scared to do that, even a little bit in the Bob Myers era when they had the pick that turned into Wiseman or the pick that turned into Kaminga. And I remember reading all the trades. It's like, oh, Pascal Siakam's on the market. Oh, oh um, um, at this time, it was Bradley Beal on the market. You should make one of those trades for those older dudes to help the Steph Curry timeline. Again, it worked out. They won the championship post that, but they haven't really taken a swing, and I wanted to see them do that. And maybe it's not too late, but Larry Marketing is not the guy. Um, that was a lot. Those are just all the things that's been in my mind, man. I, that, I just think this changes the market a little bit for Brandon Ingram as well. We're just rumored that no team, like not that no teams want him, but no team wants to pay him $200 million next season. So it's like, Okay, is he going to get moved? What does that mean for Trey Murphy the third? All right, I'm out.